You're listening to Sense and Sustainability. This is the podcast series for everything to do with sustainable supply chains. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sense and Sustainability, our series of podcasts. I'm Sean McCarthy, and it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Josh Jacobs from the United States, and we'll talk a little bit more about him in a moment. Um, Really, this is just a, a conversation with Josh about where things are, around sustainable procurement, both in the United States and in other parts of the world, and uh, anything else we might choose to uh, to speak about. So welcome, Josh. Good afternoon to you, Sean. Good morning from me. Um, I I have to start, first off, thank you for that very kind introduction and, of course, your friendship over the years. Sense and sustainability. Let me tell you right now, when you told me the name, I was overjoyed for the simple reason that such a great pun, obviously, as always coming from you guys. I'll I'll tell you right now, sense and sensibility. My wife has seen every version of every movie that's ever been made by a Jane Austen. Now, I mean, I'm telling you right now, I now am off at Mr. Darcy. Like, that's all I'm saying. I've never read the book. And I know Mr. Darcy, I mean, come on, man. So I love the sense and sustainability. I'm, I'm over Well, I, 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 I need to give some credit for this, actually, because we had a little competition among the team about who could come up with the best title. And, and David, who's not on this podcast, but he sat there quietly recording. His wife, Laura, actually came up with that. Oh, so it's not even David. It's Laura. <laughs> no, it's not even David. No, it, it was Laura. David. Okay. okay. No, well, it was Laura. We, we had to give her a bottle of champagne as the prize. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Laura, wherever you are, you are worth a Jane Austen novel. Let me tell you, that's absolutely phenomenal opening to to start off with sense and sustainability, um, which, again, you and I have a lot of one of those. And the other side, occasionally some would debate. on the yeah, they, they, yeah, they would. But we'll, we'll come to that. <laughs> anyway, um, so Josh, uh, tell us a bit about yourself, about your background and, and how you got involved in the ISO 2400 committee. So it's a real long and winding road, Sean. You know, it's funny. I grew up wanting to be in the sciences. I was, I literally from my earliest memories was fascinated with animals and really was driven to do one of two things. I either wanted to study why, you know, tigers in the wild, like literally go out and stare at tigers, you know, marking trees and killing, you know, deer and sambar deer and, and, you know, all that it takes. People. Yeah. and and Hopefully not people. people. (laughs) Hopefully not me, but, you know, yeah, you know, study tigers or work in a zoo and be a zookeeper. And I really focused on that, you know, and, and was when my family went on vacations, we went to zoos in different towns, like who does that? You know what I mean? And, and was just, so it was really a passion. And I went into college as a zoology major. The only problem is this was pre-internet for those that can't see me. I'm a really old guy and didn't really fully understand what it took to get the degree in zoology. Right. I I understand. Okay, I picked a school that was a good school to go to and and I knew it was good and rankings and stuff like that for zoology. But I didn't understand was you needed a significant amount of math in in the zoology program that I picked. And I walked into calculus, my freshman class, first day. And the gentleman, the professor who was an incredibly intelligent human being, was a gentleman who had been over in America from Russia for about 16 months, had a very thick accent and would teach with his back to the students and just write on the board. Well, me and math are not the best of friends. I mean, you know, through school, I got my B's and I was okay in math and did very well in the other stuff. But immediately, I, I mean, I raised my hands about three minutes in and I lost feeling in my arm because an hour and a half later, he still hadn't turned around and answered my question. And I was like, well, I'm screwed. This is a problem. I can't. I can't do this. I tried, you know, after school or out of, out of class help and tutoring and all sorts of stuff. And again, the online system wasn't it, what it is today. So I really tried and I just couldn't do the math. So I, I went into a pretty deep depression, you know, freshman year of college and not because, you know, of drinking or girls at that time. It was because, you know, I was losing a dream and I changed schools, went back to my state and went back to my state school, which was wonderful. And I worked on a communications degree. Because as we've already talked about, I like to talk and, you know, I'm I'm pretty open about that. And I figured, hey, here's a path that I can go down that I can do something and love a history. So I took history as as part of my degree as well and got out. And my first official job outside of school, I actually did the Disney College program, where the Disney College program, you actually go live at Walt Disney World 
on part of their property, uh, not any of the nice hotels, by the way. And you take classes with them and learn how, you know, this massive brand does their business. And then you work in the parks and party at night and, you know, all that that entails with a bunch of college kids and, and foreign students, because this was down in Orlando. So you had the, the foreign students working the different Epcot places and things like that. It was a wonderful time. And my current wife and I both actually, we were dating in college and we both got accepted and went down to Orlando. Well, at that time, I started as a bellhop at the Tower Hotel, if anyone knows what that is. Really fun ride. But they opened up Animal Kingdom. And I said, oh, cripe, this is a chance. So I actually transferred to open, help open up the Animal Kingdom and I became a safari driver. I have one of the big buses that are at the Animal Kingdom driving around the animals. And, and I was really good at that, right? Because I can talk and I love the animals and I help you know, show people what was going on. And that was awesome. But I also got to work with some of the Imagineers during the opening, the people who designed the parks and stuff like that. And I got into, and I helped develop the first newsletter for the Africa area for the cast members that we made it like a newspaper and it, it was fun. So I was using my degree. I was also using my communication, but my love of biology and stuff like that. Well, my wife and I decided, you know, working for a mouse was, was not in our long-term goals. Loved our time there. One of my favorite jobs I've ever had. But then we moved back north and I, okay, I need to find a job. So I took a job in a, a PR firm, like you do with a communications degree. And I, I helped work for Macworld Expo. I was there when, you know, they announced the iMac and things of that nature and worked with the press and different things. But it was technology. So it was still science-y to me and it, it still held my interest. I did a couple of different jobs there. And then a number of years later, my wife and I had moved down to Atlanta, Georgia from outside Boston and Providence, Rhode Island. We moved down to Georgia for my wife's job and I was out of a job again. And I said, okay, what am I going to do? And found a job down here, became a director of marketing for an ad sales agency, which wasn't enthralling and was not hitting the buttons for me. So, you know, about a year or two in, I, I started to look for another job and I found a continuing medical education company kind of back in that science world that needed a director of marketing. And they were focused on college education right? So really looking into educating, you know, folks that help save people from cancer, right? And, and, and make their world better. And I said, okay, I need this job. I physically needed the job because I couldn't do what I was doing anymore. It didn't satisfy me emotionally or intellectually doing that. So I, I said, I'm really throwing myself in and I got that job and it was wonderful. And I love my time there helping, you know, garner more interest in the education of oncologists and things of that nature and working around the world. And it was wonderful in, in that sense, especially because I had just had my, my wife and I were planning on having children and I, I want to be able to get up in the morning and look at my child and say, I'm trying to make a difference. Well, a couple of years into that, you know, I, I, I got the bug of interest in other things and sustainability was sort of becoming a thing. And I interviewed for a job as director of marketing at a place called Green Guard Environmental Institute. Green Guard Environmental Institute was started by a woman named Dr. Marilyn Black. She was the first woman PhD in chemistry out of Georgia Tech. Her claim to fame besides that, and besides being an incredibly intelligent uh, person and, and one of the true pioneers in, in the industry of product emissions coming off products is she actually tested what came off chemically in emissions from the moon rocks. So there's a theory out there somewhere that uh, tall tale that she might have a piece of the moon in her house somewhere, but I've never seen it. Um, and if I have, and NSA is listening to this, I don't know that's true, but got to work there for a number of years and really started to get involved in the sustainability movement and all that. But after a couple of years of being there as the director of marketing, I was recognizing that things like LEED and Brienne and some of these procurement policies and, and different things were coming out and they were referencing Green Guard incorrectly. So while we are doing a great job getting architects and designers and manufacturers to utilize Green Guard and focus on low emitting materials and less chemicals in your indoor environment, we weren't, we were having to go correct people a lot. So I said, okay, well, what are we going to, you know, we need to change this. So I kind of changed over to I said, well, look, you know, you can find a lot of people to do director of marketing stuff, but I, I think we need more public affairs. Like we need someone, government affairs, public affairs, getting involved in these things, being involved. And I, at, that was the moment, Sean, where I realized when people ask me today and they say, hey, distill your job down to a sentence. Unlike you, who've now asked me for my background and I've gone on a diatribe of 50 minutes. They say, distill what you do down to this little sentence. I tell people I'm a translator. 
I found that I had a skill where I could take what really, really some of the smartest human beings I've ever met. And as you and I both know, sometimes they say things and they don't, they don't make sense to the world, right? They make sense in their world and incredibly important for what we're trying to do, but it doesn't always translate. And I found I was able to take that incredibly intelligent things and distill it to my level of understanding, which allowed me to walk into the government offices for the US or jurisdictions or universities and translate to them, hey, this is why you need to do this. And this is why it's important. Green Guard ended up getting purchased by UL, Underwriters Laboratories, which does a ton of things at the time in sustainability. We were one of the first EPD program operators, certainly one of the first in North America, one of the first on a global basis. We did recycled content verification. Green Guard was still a major part of what we were doing. Lots of different certification programs, right? UL is considered what's called a TIC, a testing and certification organization. And there's lots of those around the world. But we were deeply involved in sustainability. And I was loving it because I was back in science, right? I, I had a basis in science, but using the skills that I had learned in college and, and such, and, and just you know whatever abilities that I was born with to do this translation. And at the time, that's when ISO 20,400 was announced, right? And UL is intimately involved in the ISO process. And I said, well, you know, if they're going to talk about sustainable procurement, I had been working with the United States General Service Administration. I had been working with some of the largest purchasers on the planet, both public and private both in the U.S. and internationally. So well, we kind of have to be involved. And no one else in the U.S. was really talking about it. So I stepped up and said, hey, I'll chair this thing if we want to. And I was able to get together a decent group of human beings, uh, Nora Nybergale from the supply chain organization, Bill Greasy from the Tile Council were early kind of friends and involved and things of that nature. And that's how we, we kind of got involved. And then we just showed up in Paris and at a gorgeous building overlooking all of Paris and was like, what the heck is this ISO thing? And to this day, I'm still shocked that we got anything done with some of the locations we went to. But that's kind of how it all came about. That's how I got into the job. That's how I stayed in the job. And it's really a weird path. So when I have kids tell me, oh, my major is in, you know, I'm in botany, but I want to get into, you know, scope one, two, and three emissions, greenhouse gas tracking, but I'm in botany. I'm like, you got nothing on me, kiddo. Like you're well ahead of where I was in college to get where I am. And, it, you know, it's the passion and, and the willingness to learn. I think that, that it's gotten me where I am. So, yeah, th- that's great, Josh. Thank you. Because it was that meeting in Paris where we uh, where we first met. And and I remember quite vividly, I mean, everybody's kind of sussing each other out. We weren't quite sure who was who. And there was a lot of discussion about how we're going to work together. And I remember the the DOTS delegation saying, oh, it would be really, it's really helpful to have a delegation from the UK. So we've got native English speakers. And I said, I said, the Americans aren't native English speakers, then, are they? And that, that's kind of where it all got started. It seems quite incredible, certainly to me, that that was, what, uh, how many years ago now? Nine years ago. It took us four years to develop the standard, as you say, in various various locations around the world, having various arguments and traumas with, with other countries. And the standard is now nearly five years old. Yeah. How are you seeing it? Uh, you know, we, we all worked really hard to pull the standard together. I, I think we all thought we'd done a good job at the end of it, although it was really painful at times. But uh, I think that ISO process of consensus can, you know, I think both of us found it very frustrating at times, but it got us there, didn't it? I I think we ended up with a robust document, but a document is just the start. You know, there's four years of work. Oh, great. We've got a document. What next? How are you seeing the standard from your perspective? I I think both in the States and and around the world, because I know you travel a lot and experience uh, a lot of different cultures and, and different environments. Yeah, well, let's just qualify that. Pre-COVID, I traveled a lot. <laughs> yeah, we all used to travel a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good we point. To, Sean and I used to see each other all around the world, and now we, we, we occasionally see each other on Zoom. No, so ISO 20,400, it, it, it's interesting. I think it is one of the more borrowed and utilized standards I know of, but it's not adopted as we traditionally think of standards, at least here in the States, right? We adopt standards into code right? Like building code and purchasing procurement requirements. So I really don't see ISO 20,400 listed as a requirement in procurement requirements. I don't see it, you know, in in different things like that, but it, it really is an interesting 
animal because I know a lot of people that have gone and looked at it and, and read it. And, and again, I, I think the great thing that we did in ISO 20,400 was we had people like Nora uh, Nybergale and Karen from the Dutch delegation who helped. They were procurement people. Like it wasn't just us sustainability wonks sitting around arguing about, you know, oh, well, what level of sustainability and what? The, no, we took it from a, this should just be how to do good procurement. Obviously, you have an incredible experience in procurement before your sustainability expertise was you know, built up over the years. You, you come, like you mentioned uh, b- before we started recording, you know, your, your history at, at, at the airport council in, in, in the UK and Heathrow, you, you were incredible on just the procurement. So we took it from a, this isn't how to shoehorn you know, and place sustainability and, and shove it into procurement. No, let's... It, it, it should just be part of the process. So let's lay out how you do regular procurement. And oh, by the way, here's how sustainability just is part of that process. So I've seen it utilized in a lot of concepts and ideas. Life cycle costing. It was one of the you know first global places that life cycle costing really came about. And that's starting to become a bigger thing. Obviously, the re- you know going through and measuring things, which again, it, it, procurement people are like, duh. Yeah, you got to measure like, but for sustainability people, it was like, no, you set a target, recycle content and great. Now we check recycle content off and we move on. Well, no, no, no. If you're at 20% this year, can you get to 25 in two years? Can you get to 30? You know, how do you, that constant improvement? So I, I think it's utilized a great deal as a learning tool and as a guidepost, but I don't see it referenced like we typically see ISO or, or standards utilized. But again, that you and I can talk about it, but that was one of our big concerns going in is we didn't want people to certify to this thing. We wanted it to be guidance. So um, that's kind of how I've seen it. I'd be interested, Sean, like, cause I know obviously in the UK and Europe, uh, shockingly enough, Europe and America do things differently. And shall I say Europe, <clears throat> the UK and America do things differently because remember you guys aren't, I, I can't include you in Europe anymore, unfortunately. But yeah, so like, how do you see it? Do you see it actually in procurement or do you see it guiding procurement? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Josh. I see it guiding and, and I, I'm also with you in terms of, you know, the, the standard being a guidance standard. Um, yes, it's a, it's a strategic framework of, of common sense. And certainly uh, in the early days when I, I kind of first started to get into sustainable procurement in the 90s in the, the airport organization where, you know, we were looking at carbon and all of those things and starting to to get into, well, actually, how can we deliver this to our supply chain? So I, I kind of developed a lot of the, the thinking there. And you mentioned earlier, you see your role as a translator. And, and that's exactly how I saw it in the early days. I, I was a procurement guy by background because I used to buy the energy for all the airports. I got into developing a carbon strategy because my chief executive wanted me to. And I didn't even know what carbon strategy was in 2000. Actually, nobody did. Um, yeah, so that was fine. You know, I, was, <laughs> I was doing the first one. It didn't really matter. You know, I, I, It could be anything I wanted. You can't be, you can't be measured a grade if there's no benchmark. <laughs> exactly. So, so I did this carbon strategy. Strategy. And then, then, and then he said, "Well, okay. Well, so now you're a really commercial guy, and you you get all this green stuff that these environment people talk to me about. So, so now go away and, and develop me a sustainable procurement strategy. And this was in I don't know 2001 or something like that. And there weren't any sustainable procurement strategies either. So you know, when you're first, you get to make it up, which is good. But I, I think I found straight away then engaging with our colleagues in the environment department at the time." They were like little internal NGOs. They'd run around making you feel guilty about how you're screwing up the planet. And I used to say to them, well, look, tell me what you want my supply chain to do. And they'd wave around this big questionnaire with like, you know, 40 pages of questions to ask your suppliers. Well, what use is that? What, What do you want my supply chain to achieve? Right. And they didn't understand the question because it's like, oh, no, well, it's all terrible. And, you know, we need to save the planet. And uh, no, what do you want my supply chain to do? Right. I can't, I can't save the, I can't literally, literally, I can't save the whales today. No. But it, 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 okay, that's a goal. You want the oceans not to be that warm. Okay. Then I can work on that, but I need steps. Like, I can save them one flipper at a time, you know. (laughs) So, so, uh, you know, 
it was just not working. And I had a very bright MBA a lady who was doing an, an MBA at the time um, working with me. Um, and she made this sustainable procurement strategy, her MBA dissertation. And it took her a year to develop the goals. What is it, you know, and we've embedded this into the standard, this thinking to say the first thing you do is work out as an organization what it is you're trying to do and what it is you want your supply chain to do to support it. It took a year to do that. I, but it sounds so simple. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. so again, it's it's like, so I equate it to this. What you just described, and it happens everywhere. It's not just you guys back in 2001. Mm. Which, by the way, I'm sure people had to look up how to spell sustainability back in <laughs> So yeah. again, you guys should get a lot of kudos for what you did. But the amazing thing to me is it's like, and I'll cop to this. My wife and I occasionally do this, where you you develop a grocery list of what are we going to buy this week? And yet you didn't plan out any meals. And then you get to like the next week, like you get the groceries, you know, you go get the groceries on Saturday or Sunday. And all of a sudden Monday, like afternoon, you're like, okay, what's for dinner? And everyone's like, looks at each other like, wait, what? But. Uh, you need to know what you want as the goal. Yeah. Now, it's not to say that doesn't change. Of course, goals change. You sometimes are too far ahead. Sometimes you're too far behind. Sometimes, you know, priorities change and stuff like that. But you need to have a, you know, if you're going to draw a line, you need to know where the flip the line's going to go, man. <laughs> like, Absolutely. To draw it. I mean, it's, it should be obvious, shouldn't it? But yeah, we, we spent a lot of time trying to, to get that, that kind of thinking embedded into the standard. So um, yeah, I, I think for me, yes, it is being applied quite extensively in the UK. I think similar to you and my colleague, Ross Primer, as you know, has recently done a report on the application of the standard. And what he was finding all around the world is that a lot of organizations, as you say, are using it. They're not necessarily saying so because you don't have to get certified. You know, it's it's a philosophy rather than, a, you know, I go from A to B to C to D, tick this box, get the audit, get the certificate on the wall, job done. Okay. It's a journey. So, yeah, I'm seeing good take up more so probably in the last couple of years as, you know, climate change is really becoming a, a thing that everybody's focusing on. And then when people start to talk about scope three, they recognize that, oh my God, you know, what's happening in my supply chain. And a lot of my clients, you know, actually don't even know what their supply chain is beyond tier one. And they're, they're starting to think about multi-tiered supply chains and how we collect that data. And the standard works really well as a, a strategic framework to help you to do that. So I think, you know, I guess I would say it's been a success, wouldn't I? Wouldn't we both? Because we were both deeply involved. There's a lot more to do, but I, I think we've made a good start. And, you know, for me, we're coming up to the fifth anniversary of the standard, there has to be a review in the ISO process. And, and we've all said in, in the group that we work in, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't waste, right. don't waste a nanosecond revising it. Right. Because that's energy that we'd all have to take, you know, other than, you know, it'd be great to meet up again and, you know, and go around the world and what have you. But hey, I haven't got time to do that anymore. I'm getting right. Because we're actually doing, we're doing, we're actually what doing we're it. About. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah and we so, need to keep doing that. Yeah. One, one quick question, Sean. Though. Mm. You said it's a philosophy. Does that make us philosophers? No. Because honestly, <laughs> so that, makes it, that makes you what? The John Locke of, of good or sustainable philosophy? No, no. I, let, I, let, I, can I be Socrates? I, no. I, 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 I fancy the Greeks. No, Josh, you're a failed zoologist. I'm a failed engineer. Okay. <laughs> Let's, let's get real about this. Okay. I just think you said it's a philosophy. I didn't know if that made us. I get, look, neither one no. of us are Descartes. Let's all agree. We're not Descartes, but we're, you know, let's. Uh, anyway. yeah. I'm not going to no. go into the Monty Python song about that. <laughs> <laughs> you do have to be really old to know that one. Yeah. So, yeah, can I just you know, take us on, on a, another slight journey into a slightly different subject? Please. But back to thinking about the United States, so I was working, I guess it must have been about four or five years ago for a, a company in the UK that I've, I've worked with a lot, but they were parented they were in the oil and gas sector, oil and gas manufacturer and service provider, parent company based in Houston, Texas, you know, proper big not oil. Not shocking. Yeah, not yeah. shocking that they're 
in their headquarters. It, it was kind of, the, the whole thing was kind of interesting to me because I did a load of work in the UK and then they asked me if I'd go over to Houston to the parent company and help them to develop a sustainability strategy. Now, all the Brits just thought it was hilarious because they thought, you know, as, as a minimum, I was going to be run out of town with a shotgun and, you know, worst case scenario, they were going to string me up in the, in the atrium. Um, I didn't know. I'd never been to Texas. <laughs> and with, it, it a, with, a, with a proper belt buckle, though. You would get a oh, belt buckle it, it was a bit of a shock to me, I'd have to say, on many levels. <laughs> <laughs> the the size of the portions of food you know you order a steak and it starts at 16 ounces and like yeah. goes up to a whole cow uh, on a more serious note what was shocking to me as a brit of course at the time were the the rifle racks on the back of the pickup trucks of course. And, and the open display of, of lethal weaponry just yeah. really shocked me but it was they didn't run me out of town they they did kind of listen and we did do some work but before i got there they said that what because uh, i'm saying okay so we need to talk about you know environment environmental, social, economic, sustainability. No, you can't say social. Can't say what social. do you mean I can't say social? No, no, you can't say social. That, that's No, they, they, yeah. they think you're a communist or something. <laughs> so, so we could not mention the S word. The we, we talked word, about yeah. local economic benefits. We talked about employment. We talked about communities. Yeah. But we could not say social. Uh, I guess from my perspective, looking from, from the other side of the pond, I, I do see the United States kind of getting carbon now in supply chains. Where do you see it in the States with the other aspects of sustainability? You talk a lot about triple bottom line. Uh, I, I think on this podcast, we can mention the S word, but if we say it quietly, Everyone, we'll, yeah. It, we'll probably I, well, be okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't want the, the gazpacho police coming after me, as, as has been stated here in the United States. That may be an outdated reference by the time this comes out. But So social is an interesting animal in America. We consider ourselves a very, very socially advanced nation. As we know, for those of us that have been around the world, we're, we're not on that path always. We've certainly had a, a, a horrible past in terms of human rights violations of our own, both internally at our country and what we've done to other people in other countries. So I think that's the scary part to us, right? Is we have such a horrendous history, whether we want, whether everyone wants to admit it or not, that if we really start to look into it, what the heck are we going to find? And it, it's it's some of the same. And again, I, I'm, I don't want to be political about it, but it, it's, it's a fact. Some of the stuff that we're going through right now with critical race theory here in America and people, oh, we can't talk about our slavery past because it makes people feel bad. Well, I don't give a crap if it makes you feel bad. It happened. That's history. Like history feels bad and it should feel bad if it was bad and we need to make it better. So there's parts of us as, as Americans, the social side we don't touch because we're scared of what we're going to find in our in in our past. We don't touch social on on a corporate level. We didn't always touch social on a corporate level because frankly we're scared of what we're going to find. Because as you and I both know supply chains this fanciful thing before I got into the world of supply chains was it's it's an actual chain. You know, and an actual chain is solid and there's links and it's linked to link to link to link to link to link. To link. Dude we have misnamed supply chains. It's not like that at all. <laughs> right. It's a supply cluster F is what it is. Especially we know this with COVID now, right? It's a, it's, it's like Mad Max beyond Thunderdome out there, man. Like no idea what's going on most of the time. Even the people, like you said, like tier one, we barely got a handle on, but you get to tier two and three and it's where is stuff coming from? People have no idea who held it, who, what did what. And now with different slavery where we know that there's ongoing slavery, issues in our supply chains around the world. We know that there's unsafe working conditions. We know that there's children working. We know that uh, people are being not paid a fair wage for their work, even if they are being paid. So if we have to open up that Pandora's box, that, that means we have to do something about it. So that's kind of where we stood now. That kind of, I mean, you mentioned four years ago, I would say, yeah, four years ago, that's the way it was. Now, the amazing statement I'm going to make to some people, and, and I'm going to qualify some people, not, not Sean or I, these are not our views, but we certainly have dealt with people, Sean, that would be shocked by this statement. Since you were in Houston, though, the world has been changed for the lot better by Wall Street. 
yeah. the moment that financial institutions like BlackRock, like Vanguard, like Barclays, like some of the largest, you know, national global banks have sat down and said, you know what, your stock price is going to matter based on your carbon, based on your ESG, based on your diversity, based on, because, and oh, by the way, every year, CEO Larry Fink of BlackRock sends out a letter. And the last two years before this one, he sent out a letter that said, give me your carbon plans, talk, have a carbon plan. And they started voting against boards that didn't have this. Well, this year, people came to him and said, oh, Larry, you're just a woke guy. And you know, you're just doing this for show and blah, blah, blah. I loved his letter this year. I don't know if you or any of the listeners actually read his letter this year from, from last month. His letter this year was like, this ain't about being woke. He's like, I am not a woke person. I'm not here to satisfy the tree huggers or the, you know, cancel culture or this or that. He goes, carbon and ESG are about what matters to the bottom line. And the moment, the moment that your stock price can be impacted by not doing something, you've never seen corporations jump so quickly. Yeah. They follow so, the money. <laughs> right. Wait, hey, yeah. and, and this is the interesting yeah. animal, right? You and I talked about it briefly when we both spoke at COP in Glasgow last year. I, I, was, I was somewhat stunned by my compatriot on the you know, tree-hugging green weenie side, uh, which again, I am, I am one of those, that they were devastated that business was involved and finance was at COP. And it was like growing up, I don't know if you guys had this in the UK, here in the States, we would have like, you would have a little band in your town or your neighbor or, you know, around your area that only played the local clubs and like two to 300 people would go see every show and we're you there are band. But the moment they made the radio, they were sellouts, horrible, they're awful. The, the moment someone bought a t-shirt that was, you know, wasn't there at the beginning and it was a travesty. And this is what the sustainability movement was about finance. They're like appalled at how horrible and awful and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't care how someone gets to help me save the planet as long as they're here, like let them in. And, and they're, they're truly moving market, Sean. So that's a long way to say, I agree four years ago, social was a, the third rail in America, but that is quickly, quickly changing due to the financial discussions around ESG and TCFD climate risk assessments, which obviously in, in, entails some of the other social concepts. So. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about ESG now, and, and and people's. I was actually asked by a client recently, well, should we be thinking about ESG or sustainability? Well, it's the same thing. It's, it's just another. It's just another yeah. three letter acronym that you know the financial services sector has come up with now, and that's great because, as you say, that's where the money is, and that's where where business is. We'll, we'll follow the money. Josh, we've been boring our audience for the best part of three quarters of an hour now, so I guess we, I guess we better wrap. It was a pleasure as always. I, I, I did say when we set up this podcast, well, we'll just kind of see how things, where things go. So thanks very much for sharing a little bit of your, your history with us uh, and some views on the, on where we are with sustainability and sustainable procurement. But I guess uh, I guess we better stop now. I think we could talk all day. But thank you very much for uh, for joining me. And uh, I hope a lot of people listen to this podcast and gain something from it. Sean, my friend, uh, it, it is always a pleasure, as you know. And if if you haven't heard it in the last you know, couple of weeks, let me be the one to remind you, you have set a precedent in the world for a lot of us with the work you did, you know, 20 years ago and, and really come into this and the work you've done at Olympics and World Cups and, and really helped internationalize a lot of what we do about sustainability. So it's been my pleasure to be on Sense and Sustainability. Um, I didn't want to do the British accent because, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to upset anyone. But again, my wife will be overjoyed to know that I have taken some small part in, 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 a, in a Jane Austen uh, tribute podcast. So uh, thanks, my friend. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Thank you for listening to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast for sustainable supply chains. Do visit our website, iso2400.org, for more information.